Young man, the only thing that's wrong with money in this country today is that the wrong people have it. Fortunes are being amassed by nincompoop millionaires who have attempted to set up an aristocracy of wealth instead of achievement. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Oh, and while we're on the subject of nincompoop millionaires, it might be well to consider my plan for limiting the antics of their offspring by establishing a 90% inheritance tax. <laughs> Evidently, Miss Conning, you don't agree with my idea. I certainly do not. How do you expect to pass the examination in this subject? And what kind of notes have you been taking? May I see them, please? Bring them here, Miss Conning. And please hurry, you're holding up the class. Thank you. You seem to have covered the subject completely. Maybe you have some ideas on what's wrong with conditions today. There is nothing wrong with conditions. It's the people. If they weren't too lazy, they'd go out and get a job. <laughs> Did this uh, brilliant solution originate with you or your father? My father thinks the same way, too. Maybe that's what's wrong with the banking business. Huck Arning, you'll certainly have to change those views if you expect to pass your examination and get your diploma. That's all, Miss Corning. Please be seated. I won't allow you to make me the laughing stock of this campus just because I don't agree with your silly ideas on finance. My ideas on finance are the result of very careful study. And so are mine, plus experience. That's why I demand my credit for a diploma. What's a diploma to you? A mere whim. Maybe you'll be on the Riviera this summer, annexing some moth-eaten bottle of French. Now, what were we talking about? My diploma. I must insist on your changing those marks. You must insist? The trouble with you, Miss Corning, is you have an exaggerated idea of your own importance, simply because everybody kowtows to you. I don't see you doing any kowtowing. And besides, is there anything wrong with me? Yes, there certainly is. You're what I'd call a campus menace. Menace? Yes, your influence on the young men of this university is demoralizing. How dare you! I don't mean what you mean. Just what do you mean? Well, young men in the classroom see a solution to the economic problem in you. What? Instead of marked progress through education, they figure they can end the depression by marching to the altar with you. Professor, you seem to have my personal affairs all figured out. I didn't know I was so important to you. You're not. There are things more important on my mind than you. For instance? I'm much too busy on my forthcoming campaign to end the depression. Campaign to end the depression? Huh! Yes, I'm being sponsored by some very important people. Who in the world would sponsor you? Who in the world? The World Improvement League. I never heard of them. Well, there are a lot of things you've never heard of before. Excuse me. Mr. Jones, there's something else I want to say to you. Jones's conduct is outrageous. It's a disgrace to the university. You've done a splendid thing, Mr. Corning, in bringing this to the attention of the news. And I want to assure you that I'll use all the power of my paper in fighting this scoundrel. The moment my daughter showed her to me, I knew that fellow had to be squelched. Question. What is wrong with money? Answer. The wrong people have it. And sponsored by the World Improvement League. World Improvement League? That's a dangerous bunch, Mr. Moxie. I've got it. Russian secrets as we strikes at felt agents of the GPU at work. It's a headline, Lockie. GPU strikes in Pelton. Loyal campus queen leads students in protest. It's the feminine angle. Mr. Moxie, 
I don't exactly like that campus queen idea. Uh, might I suggest that we keep my daughter's name rather subdued? I don't agree with you. Miss Corning has done a patriotic thing which should result in this rascal's dismissal. But I don't want him. I want somebody to put him in his place. He's dangerous. He's a lunatic. Couldn't you force him to apologize? Apologize? Why, the man's refused you a passing mark because you didn't agree with his crazy doctrines. Miss Corning, I'm depending on you to assist Mr. Larkey. That will be a pleasure. Come on, Mr. Larkey. I'll see this wet professor gives you a diploma. When the presses begin to hum, you'll hear the dying bones of Trotsky doing a kazatsky with the remains of Professor Jones. But I don't want to see the dying remains of Professor Jones. I only want somebody to put him in his place. Yeah, we'll do that. Good morning, Professor Hammond. Good morning, Rafi. And uh, <clears throat> how's everything in Russia this morning? I don't want to hear about it. Oh, there's a very nice photograph of you on the front page, Rafi. You'd be delighted with this, really. Ah, how about a nip of vodka? Or a drink of music? Or whatever they have on the Russian steps for breakfast? If you want a cup of coffee, help yourself. But don't mention anything Russian to me. I never drank vodka and I hate caviar. Tell me, Reggie, how did you come to pick on the richest girl in Pelton when you want to start a fight? Professor Adams, if you had to sit in front of that grinning face and expound your theories on finance, surplus, and distribution, you'd know what I've been up against. <laughs> did uh, she disagree with you? Well, not in work. She just smiled and kept on smiling with that sickening grin on her face. <laughs> uh, like this. Oh, worse than that. When I mentioned what should be done with wealth, I thought the poor girl had some affliction of the face. Well, maybe she has ideas, too. You know, people of money generally do. When I marked her incorrect in class, she had the nerve to suggest that I should go and get some money and see if it changed my ideas. And that ended it, I suppose. Ended nothing. She began to stay after class, and then she got to walking home with me afternoon. Walking home with you? Sounds almost like a romance. Romance, blah. She just wanted to tell me what she thought of me and my idea. Good old Jonesy. I bet she didn't make much headway with you. You were just wasting her time. And you were wasting your time when you got mixed up with this bunch of radicals. This World Improvement League. Who are they? Oh, uh, just the World Improvement League. And who's at the head of it? Well, uh, I'm the president. You're the president? Also the vice press secretary, treasurer, sergeant at arms, and janitor. Oh, there isn't any league. I just made it up. You have a genius for getting into trouble. Well, I had to do something to look important. Reggie, you'd better apologize. And give Miss Corning anything she wants. Just because her father happens to be a rich man who's helped endow this university? No. Just because you happen to be a poor professor who has no right to opinion. And if you want to eat this summer, you'd better pull in your horns and give this girl her diploma. I'd rather resign. Uh-huh. Look at this. Hey, Bill. Come here. Grab a picture of this. This marks a spot. Secret meeting place of the GPU. What do you think of a guy like this? They give him a beautiful place like this, free to live in, and he bites the hand that feeds him. That's gratitude for you. All right, Jones. Now, come clean. I want a story out of you. That isn't Professor Jones. There he is. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Trying to get away, hey? Well, the news wants a statement from you in full. Now, wait a minute. Where did you first meet this guy, Trotsky? I met Trotsky at a Russian dance. There was blood on the snow. But we danced because we just murdered another journalist. Stop, hey. stop it, Ray. He's wait on that effort. Look, he can't insult the press. Come on, outside. He can't insult the fourth to... estate. I'll show you an estate right out here. Come on. Good morning, Professor. Nice day, isn't it? On the contrary. I just had a cable. It's raining in Russia. One moment, please. I represent the news. 
couch, satisfied, brainless, substituting money power for logic. How dare you? I'm referring to the news. Sounded personal, like something you said to me. Any slight observations I may have made to you while you were a member of my class were meant solely for the improvement of your mind and have undoubtedly been wasted. Is that so? Why did you come here anyway? I came here on a matter of apology. Oh, so you're sorry now. Don't you think it's a little late after this underhanded assault on my character? I came here to give you a chance to apologize and explain your connection with this World Improvement League. I refuse to comment on the World Improvement League. You refuse to sever your connections with it? That's impossible. Hello? Yes, Dean? Yes. Without going to class first? Yes, Dean. I'll be right over. That sounds serious. Oh, no, I, I'm going to be honored by the higher board of trustees. Perhaps I should go along with you. And you've done very well, as it is. So this pamphlet presents your ideas, Professor. Yes, my theories on surplus and distribution. Why did you have to attack the very men who form the backbone of this nation? Meaning yourself? Well, I... <clears throat> ahem, uh, uh, let us say the things these gentlemen and I stand for. You gentlemen will have to mend your ways. The people are going to insist on it. Under the banner of the World Improvement League? Yes. <laughs> <coughs> Meantime, our so-called important men and millionaires are of very little importance in your opinion, Professor. You gentlemen will have to admit it's hardly an achievement today to get a million. Well, you should try it. Well, I wouldn't mind some time. No time like the present. And at your own suggestion. It would be a very neat solution. Don't you think, gentlemen? Splendid. Splendid. Nothing could be fair. Does that mean I'm to be discharged for my opinions? Not at all. This university is a liberal institution. We merely encourage you to follow out your own ideas. When you return with a million dollars, your post will be open. Meantime, you are on a leave of absence, without pay, of course. Good day. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, that was getting out of a difficult situation very neatly. Thank you. I don't think so. I'm against letting him off this way. I'm going to see that he's trailed and his activities exposed. Conference officer so soon? Yes, uh, yes, everything passed off very nicely. You're to get your diploma. Thank you. Oh, backing down, eh? I had to back down. You see, I'm to get a million dollars. A million dollars? A million bucks for your ideas? Yes, uh, for my ideas. Like a Nobel Prize? Well, uh, not exactly, but uh, I'm to get a million dollars. I can't believe it. Well, that's what the board just said. And they meant it. Well, I wasn't exactly willing, but they insisted. Oh, boy, what a story. The professor's plan ends the depression. Yeah. <laughs> Will you go right on teaching? No, I'm to go on a leave of absence. Uh, you know, travel a bit and see the country. Will you be gone long? It's quite a while, I guess. Well, goodbye, Miss Corning. Goodbye. Where will your address be, Professor? The Ritz. I beg pardon, pal. I'm a stranger here. Could you help a fella? When are you going to quit being a stranger around here? Who, me? You got me wrong, pal. I gave you a dollar yesterday. No. It was the day before yesterday. All right, Pete, I got you this time. What is it, officer? This man trying to panhandle you? Panhandle? We got orders to round them up. The news is running a campaign against these street beggars. Mr. Moxie's news? Yes. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint Mr. Moxie, but uh, this gentleman happens to be a friend of mine. Wasn't he trying to make a touch? Why, certainly not, officer. As a matter of fact, I was trying to borrow two dollars from him. Uh, sure he was, and uh, I was just about to give it to him when you came along. Here you are. Thanks. Sorry, Professor. My mistake. Well, that's all right. 
Thanks, pal. You're sure regular. Well, goodbye, Pete. Hey, w w wait a minute. Where's my two bucks? I'll credit them to your account. Oh, you're, you're only fooling, Professor. I'm not fooling, Pete. I'm out of a job, and I've got to get a million dollars. This is a very good start. Say, that's the only two bucks I got. You know, Pete... Oh, you couldn't be a panhandler, Professor. That takes technique. Maybe you could teach it to me. Why don't you try some other racket? The other fields are overcrowded with millionaires. Your profession is the oldest on earth. Not a millionaire in it. Pete, you and I are going to form a merger. Okay, pal. Okay, pal. Now I'll explain how we work this racket. Here we are. Penny the gouge left this mark. It means easy up to a half a dollar. So we have a little system in this after all. Sure. Now I'll show you what we call the Civil War Act. Get a load of this. Could I mow you along for the price of a meal, sir? You're in no condition to work. Here. Here's the price of a meal. Thank you, sir. It's all right, sir. No, no. Like this. Look. Put the elbow in, the pinky out, now shake it. There you are. Now you got it. Come on, Professor. Well, wait a minute, Pete. I want to hear this blind man play. I'm afraid you have no soul for music, Pete. Why, this poor man's a genius. He should be playing in concert. It's me, pal. We're in the same racket. Hey, what's the matter, Pete? You trying to clear my act? Listen, Mochi's my pal. That's funny. What's funny about it? Well, I told a certain party I was going to stop at the Ritz. Oh, <laughs> well, when you're under Fritz, this is the Ritz. <laughs> <laughs> Say, maybe we can make a moocher out of them. No, he ain't got the personality. How about him doing the Civil War Act? Yeah. No, I tried him. He ain't so hot. Just what are you good at, Professor? Why, uh, theory of finance, history of banking, surplus and distribution. Oh, words to that effect. Too bad. You college men present a very grave problem. Wait a minute, Benny. I got it. Something in my line, Pete? Have you got a face for it? For what? Dummy chuck. Dummy chuck? Yeah. Chew some soap and throw a fit. Oh, I'm not going to throw fits. That's too simple. Yeah? Well, let me tell you something. It takes a good man to chuck a dummy. Yeah, go ahead and show him, Pete. Keep your eyes on me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Well, here we are. What do you suppose he can be doing in a place like this? Maybe this is the headquarters for the World Improvement League. You just let me handle it. Do you think it's safe for me to go in here? You're with me, aren't you? <laughs> Get away from that guy. He's got hydrophobia. Oh, somebody do something. Don't stand there. Get him to a hospital. <laughs> My good afternoon. Oh, are you all right now? Uh, am I all right? How did I do, boys? Terrible. Oh, oh. No technique. Professor Jones, what is the meaning of this exhibition? Why, I, uh, I was learning to chuck a dummy. Is this another of your crazy ideas? Say, how about a little statement from you? Very simple. I'm to get a million dollars, so I picked a wide open profession. Huh. So you're going to turn panhandler, huh? Exactly. It's shameful. I thought you'd have more pride than to go begging for money. Well, why not? Everyone begs. Big business spends millions on billboards, newspapers, radio to beg the public. Please buy my coffee. Please buy my tea. Please, please. Try this and try that. It's all begging. Oh, that's different. They deal with the general public. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. By today, there was a million dollars in dribs and drabs passed out on the streets to beggars all over the country. At a dollar a day, it would take you a million days. Not if I can reach a million people a day, like big business. That's it. That's it. Advertise. Reach the power of the masses. Yeah. Well, a campaign, huh? I'm going to ask the people to make me a public millionaire to carry out my ideas. At a dollar apiece, they'll never miss it. Public pen number one. Say, that's a great idea. Oh, it's crazier than his ideas on finance. Come on, Pete. Where are we going? To make a million. Huh? Come on, we're going to see what he does. Oh, I don't care if I never see him again. The guy says you've got to take out ten words or pay another dollar. I don't know how I can change a word. It's perfect as it stands. Certainly. Want it. A million people to give me a dollar apiece. To make me the first millionaire by public subscription. You'll never miss a dollar, and I promise to give you more for your money than any millionaire that ever lived. Address, Professor Reginald Q. Jones, Fritz Hotel. Now, how could I cut ten words out of that? It sounds perfect. Say, that's a swell idea, Professor. You know, I almost feel like kicking in a dollar myself. You surely don't intend to run that crazy advertisement. My intention has nothing to do with it. It takes a dollar more than we got. If a dollar is all that keeps you from making an utter fool of yourself, I don't see why I shouldn't help complete the job. Ah, the first of the million. Thank you. Settle our advertising account, Pete. Right. Say, that's a great idea, Professor. In the good old days, I used to run all kinds of campaigns to collect money. You know, the big clock in the park to show how the funds were going. I collected money for everything, from Belgium to homeless cats. How about a dollar from you? Say, listen, why don't you stop kidding? I used to run these funds on a percentage. I like your style, and I know just what you need. Only from now on, kind of ease up on associating with guys like this. Why, you? I'm not taking you in on this, Larky. Don't you worry. From now on, it's in a bag. I'll do everything. You wait till Moxie hears about this. Oh, don't tell him. He hates me. He'll spoil everything. Come back, Larky. Oh, I'd love to take a sock at that guy. Yes, I know just how you feel. And I hate to tell you what else he said about you, Chief. I tell you, that guy's a menace. From professor to panhandler. From public benefactor to public beggar. He knew all about finance in college, but now, when he's on his own resources, he can't do anything but beg for charity. I'm going to make him the laughing stock of the nation. Yes, Mr. Moxie. Hold everything on the front page for a big box head and send me in a cartoonist. Open up the entire syndicate and the Associated Press. When I get through with him, a million people will be laughing at him.
This Moxie says he's a radical. Well, I don't like Moxie. No. I'm going to send a dollar to Jonesy. Uh, me too. Here's a chance, girls, to catch a millionaire. All Professor Jones wants is a dollar from a million people, and he promises plenty. You know, I think he has a splendid idea. We'll both send him a dollar. You know, my dear, I don't like the way Moxie picks on this poor jobless professor. We're going to send him a dollar. Is it a romance? Girl who caused Jones to lose professorship gives first dollar to make him millionaire. What are you going to do about that? I'm going to have him arrested. He ought to be put in a lunatic asylum. Tough luck, pal. It's that reporter, Lockie. I'd like to get my hands on him. I'd like to get my hands on the mug that slipped this piano record on me. <laughs> <laughs> that guy thinks he's got troubles. Hey, Jones. Boy, congratulate me. I told you I'd fix it. You're made for life. Get away from me. Well, I let him have it. Hey, wait a minute. This guy's still hanging around here. Do me a favor. Send him on an errand, will you? I got a lot of business I want to talk over with you. I don't want to have a thing to do with you after this mess. Look at that. Say, what do you want for the first day? You're the talk of the country. You couldn't buy that front page space for five million dollars. It's killed me. Moxie's used his power to make me the laughing stock of the nation. He's warned everybody to ignore me. Why, you're crazy. If you could get a dollar from everyone who reads Moxie's newspaper that doesn't agree with him, you'd be worth a million dollars in 24 hours. But why did you have to drag Miss Corning's name into this matter? Why, because. I slipped that story to the opposition paper. That's the feminine angle. Romance. It's a perfect setup for sympathy. It's disgusting. It's tremendous. A girl in a mansion gives a dollar to a boy in a 20-cent lodging house to help him make a million. Say, listen, can't you see anything or are you just an adding machine? Nothing about my wonderful ideas of the distribution of surplus. Just a lot of cheap notoriety. Why, your cheap little ad wouldn't mean a thing by yourself. It's the combination. Look. You're the underdog. The public loves you. It's you against Moxie and his millionaires. And I'm going to keep him pounding and hounding you right into a million dollars. Right now, I take a cup of coffee for my chances. Right now, you're going to get a sock and a nose. Now, Pete. Hey, Joe. Come here. Some letters for you. Are you Professor Reginald Q. Jones? Oh, yes. Are these letters for me? Yes. Must be over 2,000. Well, here's a dog. Here's another one. In less than 24 hours. What did I tell you? Two thousand. Well, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute, you guys. Hey, hey the seat. Huh? Keep your fins off. Rob on the mails is 50 years. Oh, yeah. Oh, you started all this. I only wanted somebody to put him in his place, and you had to have him fired. Why don't you go to Florida, Europe, anywhere? Get away from all this. Do you think I'm going to let him drive me out of town? All right, sit down and be quiet. I know how to get rid of him. How? I've been in touch with Mr. Jones. He's coming here to see me. What does he want? Well, he's coming to see me on business, and that can mean only one thing. Money. Money? Yes, I imagine his price won't be very high. You're going to buy him off? A few hundred dollars will mean a lot to him. <sighs> Professor Jones to see you, Mr. Corning. Send him in. And you keep out of this. I'll put him in his place. Good morning, Mr. Corning. And Miss Corning. Oh, all packed, I see. Yes, that's all I had. Well, let's get it over quickly. How much? Twenty-five thousand. Twenty-five thousand? Yes. Even Miss Corning will have to admit that's pretty fair. I think it's just like you. Oh, it's ridiculous. Five hundred would be a lot. Well, it's twenty-five thousand, I tell you. See here, Jones. Haven't you caused my daughter enough annoyance without this? It annoyed me somewhat to be discharged. But I'm willing to call everything square. I suggest that you take five hundred. That's about a half a year's salary. You can go out west where I may find you a small position where your ignorance of finance can do no harm. <laughs> Do you think I came here to ask you people for money? What else? I came here to deposit $25,000. The result on two days' returns on my campaign to raise a million. $25,000 in two days? Yes, sir. <coughs> well, uh, well, of course, Professor, that alters everything. And uh, the First National is the proper place. Sound institution. 
I'll have an account open for you right away. Just a moment. I don't want to open an account. I want it changed into a $25,000 bill. And then I want to rent a safety deposit box. Oh, yes. Yes, Mr. Corning. Uh, get a safety deposit box for Professor Jones and have his money changed any way he wants it. He'll be right out. Yes, sir. Thank you, and good morning. We certainly squelched him. We certainly put him in his place. He put himself in his place, right into the hands of the postal authorities. Yes, Mr. Corning. Get me post office inspector Hardy. Yes, sir. No, they ought to be very interested in a secret fund obtained through the mails to be distributed for purposes known only to Professor Jones. Hey, fellas, you're just in time. Look, grab yourself a flock of pictures and we'll spread this all over the front page. I've studied your plan for distributing distressed surplus at cost and feel it to be a blessing for manufacturers like myself who face ruin unless we can dispose of surplus to meet bank loans. What is the actual labor and material cost of this to you, Mr. Travis? Ninety cents. And the retail price? About three dollars. Well, if you leave this here as a sample, I'll see what I can do. Thank you, Professor. Good day, Mr. Travis. Good day. This will kill you. From an old maiden Kanky Key. She's got a surplus of love that needs distribution. <laughs> Father. There's something up. I just saw Moxie and Corning downstairs with a couple of suspicious-looking characters. Well, I seem to be getting very important lately. Listen, any guy that's got nearly a half a million bucks is important. Where's Joan? He's busy in the private office. You got an appointment? Yes. Uh, now, Professor, I've got to get a statement. I've been trying to get this interview for days. You see, our first... Th oh, hello, Mr. Moxie. Professor Jones? Yes. I'm Inspector Hurley of the Post Office Department. Well, how do you do? Mr. Corning and Mr. Moxley have brought your activities to our attention, demanding we investigate your use of the mails. Well, I, I can assure you, gentlemen, everything's above board. You're using the mails to foster a radical fund. That's not true. Oh, no, boss. I've got the inside right Oh, here. don't boss me. You're fired. You're in this with Jones. You have betrayed the news, and any man who will betray the news will betray the nation. Oh, you can see for yourself, Inspector. I've kept an absolute list of everybody contributing. And I haven't touched the dollar of the fund in accordance with my promise not to do so until the entire million is subdivided. Yes, but your advertisements promise more for the money than any millionaire that ever lived. And I intend to carry them out. How? By hiding money in a safety deposit box? That's my individual business. There's where you're wrong. No individual is allowed to campaign money by mail. It would be different if this were an organization. But this is an organization. I'm carrying out the plans of the World Improvement League. Well, uh, is it a responsible organization? Oh, yes, they're a fine body of public-spirited citizens who are in absolute accord with my theories on the distribution of surplus. In that case, I would suggest that you bring your board of directors to meet the directors of the First National Bank on Friday morning. Friday morning? Yes. Yes. Meantime, you will withdraw the money from the safety deposit box, put it into a trust fund, which will be controlled by the bank, pending the outcome of this meeting. Very good, Inspector. What's the matter? Don't let them get you down, pal. Boys, that's the finish. Huh? What? There isn't any World Improvement League. No? No. It's just the name I made up while I was at the university. Make people think I was important. There goes a half a million bucks right in the hands of the bankers. And we didn't even take cigarette money out of it. Well, 
We've got a lucrative profession still left, Pete. Wait a minute, pal. When the directors of the First National Bank gather around the festival board Friday morning, they're going to see the finest bunch of public-spirited citizens they ever saw in their life. I think I'll buy a million shares of steel. I'll take a million dollars worth of bonds. But steel is much higher. Rails is foiber. Bonds is going up. And look at rubber. Yeah. Come on, you mugs. Rehearse. Put some life in it. You ain't bought a nickel's worth of stock in an hour. You're supposed to talk in the millions. Oh, what's the matter, Pete? I thought we were doing pretty good when we sold them the Pennsylvania Railroad. Ah, oh, you're terrible. I don't think you guys was ever in a bank. Who, me? I was almost in a bank once when the tunnel caved in. Yeah. Well, tomorrow you're going in through the front door for a change. And what worries me is, is what you guys is going to do when you meet the president. Oh, there's nothing to it. It's in the pillow slip. Yeah? Well, imagine I'm a big bank president, and you're one of them public-spirited citizens. You're a big shot, I'm a big shot. All right, now. You walk into the bank, but come right up to me. Now, what do you do? Here I come. How are you, Governor? Who said anything about Governor? Oh, my Mr. President. How about loaning me a poultry two hundred dollars? Listen, I said I'm a bank president. A cold fish that wouldn't give a nickel to his grandmother. Oh, and I'll show you how it's done. I'll make you the president. I'd like to be president of a bank for just one hour. Yeah? All right. Now, you're the bank president. I'm coming into you. Now, you mugs watch. I walk right in dignified. I don't even look at the money. I come right up to you, and what do I do? Well, what do you do? I bow. Oh. That's the first thing a gent's got to know how to do. Now, I bow, and you bow. Not like that. Bend the back, like this. <laughs> <laughs> hey, lay off. Where's your dignity? You're supposed to be a bunch of public-spirited citizens. All right, get around the conference table. Now, remember, you mugs, you're doing this for my pal Jonesy. If you let him down tomorrow, it means the bank grabs control of the dough. The public has trusted my pal with this money. And he's got a great idea on how to end the depression. When people get more dough, they have more dough to give away. But if them high binders get their mitts on that dough, there won't be enough left to buy a bag of peanuts. And there's one more thing I want to tell you, guys. When you meet them mugs, don't try to panhandle them. No, that's right. Here you are, fellas. Where did you get those? Now, don't be too inquisitive. I just borrowed them. Oh, yeah? Yeah. 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 Well, Professor, your board seems to be getting along nicely. Oh, yes, they always do manage to get along. And uh, no common stocks. In fact, I don't like anything common. I haven't met you. My name is Smith. How do you do, Mr. Smith? Glad to have met you. Ixnay, Ixnay, M. Uh, beg pardon, Counselor. Our London delegate has forgotten his cigar case. Oh, that's too bad. It's all right. Uh, what kind of cigars do you smoke? Corona, Corona. Thank you, Counselor. Well, it's all right.
A peculiar looking body of men, all these end poverty advocates have that eccentric look. Too bad. I didn't know conditions were so bad in your country, Counselor. <coughs> what a dirty dog. Your delegate from Greece was telling me of the terrible conditions in the food situation. Why, you, you didn't understand him. He don't talk good English. I'll speak to him in his smarter tongue. Uh, Ixne am scray, or I'll break your acne. He's a umche, I can say. Am scray, um, very hokey dokey. I knew you didn't understand. You see, he wants to put the entire funds of his government in your bank. Well, I'll be delighted. Thank you, Counselor. Gentlemen, in my capacity as trustee, I would like to ask your opinion as to some investments for your funds. Now, first, let us consider the Eastern and Western Railway. Why, uh, I don't like Eastern and Western. Well, why not? What's wrong with Eastern and Western Railway? Well, the, the road bed's no good. The, the ties are coming loose. Have you inspected the road recently? Every foot of it. Now, take the fences. Uh, now, there's the railway. I agree with the gentleman. We should buy Pennsylvania. Yep. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Certainly. And now, gentlemen, we come to the copper situation. Uh, Mr. Hawkins, uh, uh, what is your opinion of coppers? Uh, I don't want anything to do with coppers. You consider them unreliable? Well, I'd rather not take a chance with them. Those are my sentiments exactly. Righto. I don't like coppers myself. I suggest we avoid them entirely and take up the silver situation. Is everything satisfactory, Inspector? I'm really amazed, Jones. Mr. Coring, I think you'll have to admit you were wrong about the World Improvement League. Well, not necessarily. However, I must admit that they seem to be experts on coppers and railways. Well, Willifant, isn't Miss Coring? <laughs> Late again, just like the first time. But don't you worry about it. I got all the details and you and I are right up together for the news. How's that? I had an idea you were fired. Fired? Who, me? Good old Moxie fired? No, say, he and I are like that. See that? That's me. <laughs> now, wait a minute. I wouldn't go in there if I were you. There's a very important meeting in there. You know, all the big shots. They might not like that. The World Improvement League? Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm really curious to see a fine body of public-spirited citizens who would approve Professor Jones's idea. Oh, now, wait a minute. Why don't you and Jonesy call this quits? He'll soon be in your class. You know, he's almost a millionaire now. <laughs> and worked it up to a hundred... I tell you... <laughs> Irene, what is it? <laughs> Are these the members of the World Improvement League? Oh, yes. What's funny about it? They're a bunch of panhandlers. How do you know? I saw them the other day. They all live in a cheap hotel at the other end of town. Their business is living by their wit. Professor Jones was with them when they thought of this idea of how to get money. Is this so, Jones? I'm afraid it is. Well... This alters everything. I think you'd better turn the fund over to the bank to be redistributed to the public. Inspector, I appeal to you to give me a chance to complete this fund. The public gave me this money to carry out my ideas and not to turn it over to these men. We see money and its uses in a different way. They represent possession, privilege, power. Well, there's something wrong with their ideas, and men like myself want a chance to try something different. <laughs> Another brain trustee. Out of my way, I've been contaminated. 
What an insult. I'm going to recommend that this fund be impounded. This money was contributed on consideration of what you would do if you had a million dollars. And you're short of that mark. But I can get this million if you'll only give me leeway to operate. I'll allow you 15 days. If at the end of that time the fund is not completed, I will order it distributed back to the public through the bank. Thank you. Keep it, Professor, with my compliments. Besides, I have an idea you've got something up your sleeve. They ain't stopped us yet. The professor's got a chance to talk on the radio. Nervo toothpaste. Nervo toothpaste? Rub it in your gums, it penetrates the nerves, it pacifies. You never get nervous with Nervo. Yes, I've been in communication with the Nervo people. They seem to think it a good idea to put me and my associates on the radio as an example of how much nerve you can have if you use Nervo. <laughs> it Splendid. It's a chance to work in an appeal to 15 million listeners. If I can get in on that hour, I'll complete this plan. Best of luck to you, Professor, and I'll keep in touch with you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Say, this is a swell gang. If we had some ham, we could have some ham and eggs if we had some eggs. <laughs> There's a funny one. <laughs> You'll never get on the radio with jokes like that. No? Well, listen to this one. I had an accident today. I threw a cigarette out of a second-story window. And how was that an accident? I forgot to let go of the cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you guys have got something to laugh about. Any word yet? Yeah, I just came from the bank. It's full of clerks running up a lot of expenses and only one sack of mail. Nothing from the Nervo company? No, but Corning promised he'd let me know just as soon as anything came. They promised to advance me $1,000 expense money to bring the boys to Chicago. Yeah. You'll have to give him that check. It's not a contribution to the fund. Don't worry, my dear. I'll give it to him when there's no danger of him reaching 15 million people. Dad, Dad, that's illegal. Well, there are times when men of responsibility must take steps to protect the public. But it's a personal letter between the Nervo Company and Professor Jones. Well, we're handling all his mail now as trustees. What difference could it make sending him this money? He needs it. It might make a difference of $200,000 in eventual fees for handling this fund. Besides, the public must be protected. Fools like Jones have no right to money. Dad, this is the very kind of thing Jones has been saying about you. What did he say? He said that people like you, when they have some illegal thing to do for money, always find some high moral ground to put it on. Jones is a radical, a troublemaker. Besides, there's nothing illegal in what I'm going to do. I'm going to send this check back to the Nervo people. Dad. Eh? I quarreled with Professor Jones in class. I was responsible for his being discharged, thrown out on the street, because I believed he was wrong. And it's going to be dreadfully humiliating for me now to have to apologize. Irene, where are you going? So your old man's a crook. I've got to get that check from your father. He's already sent it back. But how are we going to get to Chicago? I have a roadster. Nix. A dame once took me out in a roadster to get me bumped off. Yes, how do I know this isn't a trick just to get me out of town? You'll have to trust me. Well, I don't see why you're going to all this trouble just on my account. Because I don't think you'll ever become a very good panhandler. Oh, so you think I'm a failure at everything? Hey, a telegram from Nervo. What does it say? In front of her? Well, that's all right. Go ahead. Read it. Read it. Expect you broadcast 8 o'clock tomorrow evening with your Knights of the Road, leading exponents of Nervo. Knights of the Road. That's my gang. 24 hours to get to Chicago and no money. We can make it in the car. But there's only room for two of us. What about the rest of the boys? Never mind about the boys. When them mugs make up their mind to travel, all the railroads give them service. Well, come on, let's go. <laughs> so long, pal. See you in Chicago. Yes, good luck, Pete. Goodbye, Bye. Professor. Good luck, Larky. Kidnapped. Kidnapped? What's your name? Uh, Irene Corning. 
Give me your description. She's 20 years old. Dark hair, dark eyes. Got a blue dress on. Calling all cars. Calling all cars. Be on the lookout for Miss Corning. Age 20. Dark hair. Dark eyes. This young woman was last seen with Professor Jones in a light tan roadster. License number 11-764. Extra, extra. All about the kidnapping. Heiress kidnap. Extra. Paper, mister? Well, I guess we lost him. I'm going to take a chance on hitchhiking to Chicago. Well, what's the matter? I saw your father waving his arms to a policeman. Next thing you know, he'll accuse me of kidnapping. Won't that be exciting? Well, I wouldn't put it past him. Dad's smart that way. Yes, and in a lot of other ways, too. Why don't you go back home? I wouldn't pick up just any man on the road, but you've got a nice, kind face. Will you let me alone? Ever since I've known you, I've had nothing but trouble. And that's nothing to what will happen if you don't get in this car. Nothing more could happen. Oh, yes, there is. If you don't get in this car, I'll tell them you did kidnap me. Oh, you wouldn't do that. I'm going to get you to that broadcast if it's the last thing I do. Reggie. Huh? That's your name, isn't it? I mean, your human name, if you've got one. like I'm being the one that's kidnapped. Don't worry, Mr. Corning. He can't get away with it. We've got everything covered. Railroads, airports, steamships, and all waterfronts. I don't care what you cover. Get my daughter out of the hands of that lunatic and his bunch of notorious characters. Spare no expense. Yes. Well, let's get some. Have you got any money? Yes, seven hundred and ninety thousand dollars. But not a cent with me. Your father's got it all. How about you? I left so hurriedly, I haven't any money either. Oh, that's nice of you. Leaving me high and dry in the middle of nowhere. Oh, why should I do that? Well, I can't understand unless you enjoy getting me into trouble. Try to get yourself out for once. It's lucky I learned a little trade. There's a house over there. Get a load of this. What's happened to your hand? That's what we call the Civil War Act. No man would make me more lawn with a hand like this. Can I mow your lawn for the price of a meal, mister? You certainly can. Happy till I'm in jail.
Reggie, I've never had so much excitement in all my life. I don't know why I ever let you talk me into this. Haven't you got any idea where we are? No. Good. Let's stop here until daylight. Stay here all night? Well, why not? We've spent half the night in the car already. It isn't right. I feel perfectly safe with you. Huh? Well, why shouldn't you? I suppose it's because I'm not attractive to you. Yes, yes, maybe that's it. Why don't you relax? That's it. Yes. What are you going to do if you get a million dollars? Distribute the surplus. Will it make any difference in your life to get this money? Yes, change everything. Good. Tell me about it. The trouble with this country is the uncertainty of disposing of surplus. If a manufacturer sold part of his goods at a profit, and was sure the remainder would be bought by the government at the cost of material and labor, there could be no business failures. I don't think you're listening. Yes, I was. You were talking about what was wrong with the country. Well, what is it? The trouble with the country today is surplus women and no distribution. Verse 7 or 9. I don't know which, but I lost my ticket. Silence. What is this? A cattle car? I tell you, Chief, there's no sign of Jones. We've been here since 5 o'clock. Yeah, we're right out here where you can see everything. The other actors are rehearsing. Okay, Chief. you told me you could sing. I could sing like a canary if them cops wasn't watching us. Oh, shut up. They can't hear us. Huh? All right, boys, we go on the air in five minutes. You come on after I finish my announcement. Okie doke. Oh, thank you. What's it look like, Lockie? If you step out in front of that glass, you'll be like a goldfish in a bowl. You won't get a chance to say three words. I'll talk to those detectives and explain everything. Did you ever try explaining anything to a detective? Oh, can't you think of a way to get rid of them? I got it. Huh? What? Now, that's thinking fast, Pete. Listen, you go on out there and make this the performance of your life. Come on, go ahead. event in the history of Nervo, the famous Professor Jones, whose appeal over this station, we hope, will complete his fund to distribute the wealth. Don't let him bite you, Mike! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to one of the most sought-after men in the country. As you probably know, I am wanted by the authorities for the kidnapping of Miss Corning. But I have a surprise for you. Miss Corning is standing near me and will speak to you in just a few moments. Let go of me! Let go of me! He'll run down like a clock. <laughs> oh! 
Meantime, folks, I appeal to you to send me a dollar to help complete a fund that is already four-fifths subscribed. <laughs> and in conclusion, folks, I promise to keep faith with all of you. You're under arrest, Jones. You can't arrest him. I wasn't kidnapped. Come on. There you are, folks. Only Nervo toothpaste could have given Jones his iron nerves to withstand this terrific strain. Here, take, take those down the express office. Get them right off, will you? Hey, Benny, Benny, come yeah. here. Take those parcels down there. Okay, oh, down. Take them up. Everyone who gave me a dollar received some article worth up to three dollars. And each manufacturer received ready cash to pay off his obligations. Well, it was just a demonstration to show what could be done. I thank you for your support. Good luck, Professor. Thank you. Lots of it to you, sir. Thank you. How's the millionaire this morning? Well, he's just plain Professor Jones again. Why, if I wrote another check, I'd be put in jail. Well, you were a millionaire for a day. Now what are you going to do? Go back to Pelton University. They told me to come back when I made a million. Father said they told you to come back when you had a million. Oh. I see. Hey, Professor, listen to this. Here's a letter from Detroit. Your article was the best value I ever received. I'm enclosing another dollar. Do it again. And here's one from uh, St. Louis. Just what I needed. Enclosed is another dollar. Good luck. Listen to this one from Toledo. Your bargain was a sensation. The entire neighborhood is sending you a dollar. I suggest you call it the Bargain of the Month Club. Bargain of the Month Club. Say, that's a slogan. That's terrific. Why, well, you'll have another million dollars in no time. But how can we stay in business if we don't make any money? I bought and sold at cost. Well, I've got an idea. If you charge one penny a piece on a million subscribers, you make $10,000 a month. Say. Why, it's a business. You're telling me? I'll have to have a staff. We'll have to open up branch offices all over the country. Well, why not? Pete, Pete, you stop for Boston to handle territory there. You've got to go to work. Mike, I think the success has gone to your head. <laughs> Mooch, you take the San Francisco branch. All right with me if you make these other mugs work. All right. And Sophie, you take Hollywood. Yes. If anybody takes Hollywood, it's going to be me. <laughs> so this is your new office. Yes. How do you like it? Oh, it's beautiful. You see, my theory on surplus and distribution was right. Seeing you're so successful, I'm going to open an office myself. You are? What for? To distribute surplus women. <coughs> We're just coming to that. Reggie! <laughs> yes, Mr. Yes, Jones. Mr. Yes, Mr. Jones. I'm confronted with a situation that I'll have to handle myself. Yes, yes, Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones.